Hello, everyone. We're here on our third of the web series, Like Father, Like Son, Theological Eavesdropping with Randall Johnson, who's my dad, and myself, Stephen Johnson. And if you're hanging in with us through the first couple, we've talked about uh, the nature of suffering, how Christians engage with suffering. We talked about the coronavirus and whether God caused it, whether it's the judgment of God. And we're now going to another topic that, uh, again, was part of the uh, reason that we're doing this web series is so my dad and I, we talk a lot when I'm preaching and I'm preaching a series on second Corinthians right now. And the title of the series is finding power through weakness. And the idea is that in the scripture, particularly in second Corinthians, but definitely in other places, we see God repeatedly uh, making his power known in our weakness. And so what I wanted to talk about today with you, dad is, you know, you know, what does the Bible say about that? And then how does it work out in our lives? And what's the, what's kind of the a potential pathway for us even to, to step into this reality of, uh, I'm going to quote Second Corinthians 12, that God's strength being made perfect in our weakness. So uh, why don't you kick us off with a little intro on that topic? <laughs> okay. Well, you know, I think um, one of the main um, concerns we have as human beings is, is our weakness. Mm -hmm. I don't want to be weak. Um, I hate weakness. I've, I've seen a lot of people in recent days uh, crying, you know, mm -hmm. when they talk about loved ones. Oh, and they apologize. I'm sorry. Right. You know, I, I'm appearing to be weak. And I fear weakness because it means I don't, I don't have control. Right. I think that's kind of my, my basic underlying sin issue is I want to be in control. That goes right back to Eve in the garden wanting to be like God, right? Herself. Absolutely. I don't want God deciding what's good and evil. I want to decide what's good and evil. Right. And I should, I should add Adam also had the same problem. It wasn't yeah, just he was, Eve. He was there. <laughs> <laughs> but we just don't get the full story of Adam. We get the full story of Eve. You know, she wants to be like God. It's desirous to her to be like God. Well, and you know, we do all kinds of things. I think good to, to increase our strength, exercise, healthy diet, those kinds of things, good choices. Um, but that's still kind of an underlying fear. Am I going to be strong? Am I going to be tough enough? Can I determine my own destiny? This is probably a subset of that, but I would also like to add that a lot of times we don't want, we're afraid of our weakness because we know that it will be taken advantage of. We live in a world where we're surrounded by people and you know, the, the full version of this, like the hundred percent version of this is when you've got one of these narcissists who is actually looking for the weaknesses in others that they can take advantage of and prey upon for their own gain. So we don't want to be the victim of that kind of uh, interaction or, or activity of others. No, we don't. No, we dread that. That's uh, probably why we hide ourselves so much. Right. right. And I think I hiding be my weakness, <laughs> right? <laughs> it may yeah. be there, but maybe I can camouflage it or disguise it. Yeah. And I, I, and we're skipping ahead a little bit, but I think that's one of the, one of the reasons that scripture is so big on confession is that what we're doing when we confess to the Lord, there's an aspect of confession that is aligning our values with the values of God and aligning our, you know, what is right and wrong with what God says is right and wrong. And that's very true. But there's another aspect of confession that's saying, here's my failure, and I'm going to present it truthfully and honestly before you, God, and before other believers, other people. So I'm going to be laid bare, so to speak. Mm -hmm. I think of 1 John chapter 1, you know, walking in the light as he is in the light. And if we say we're without sin, we walk in darkness. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us. But it also says that if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we will have fellowship with one another. So he's bringing in this communal aspect too. And I think that might inform a little bit about how we talk about walking in weakness. Again, I'm getting ahead. Sorry. But um, yeah, well, that, that just made me think of James 5, 16 too. Um, yeah. You know, confess your sins that you may be healed. He's, I got to tell you my sins. <laughs> you know, right. this, is not, this is not a private confession. This is a public confession. 
ouch, you know, that's, that's scary. Right. But that it's we're, we're already getting ahead of ourselves, but it's that pathway of stepping into weakness that actually brings about that power of God for healing or the power of God for unity and relationship that we all long for. And I think if we were to step back in the garden for a minute, you know, Adam and Eve sin and God says, you know, there's this pronouncement of death. And you talked about how Adam and Eve are separated from God, but they're also separated from one another. So they've got these coverings that they put on, whereas before they did not have coverings. And we don't see it explicitly, but I would argue that we're even, there's a separation that we experience from ourselves where we don't even want to see what's true about ourselves. We want to avoid looking at our own weaknesses which makes David's prayer of search me and know me so powerful is that I don't want to be searched and known. I don't even want to delve into my own sin because I don't like what I find there. I'd rather ignore it and um, binge watch Netflix for, for the entire, you know, coronavirus lockdown instead of having to face my own reality internally. Yeah. That whole process of denial and man, we're good at it. It comes naturally. Yeah. So I think we've hit on uh, the kind of the spiritual weakness. What about physical and, and other types of weaknesses? Yeah, well, I think, um, you know, something you said made me think about um, physical weakness from the standpoint of as we age. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I least want to have happen is that I'm totally incapable of caring for myself and um, you have to take me to the bathroom or you know right. you have to wash me or you know those kind of things were like the ultimate um, humiliation right my weakness so obvious and apparent physically and um, can, can we stop for a minute and just talk about how unnatural that feeling is because when you were born you were washed and bathed and your bottom was wiped. And that's a totally appropriate uh, dynamic of the human condition. And yet I think most of us fear ending up in that place. I guess as, as children, we know and, and appreciate how weak we are. Right. You know, we can't care for ourselves. And I think that terrifies us. Um, and we look to people to trust them, to, to care for us. And, and not every one of us is rewarded with that, you know? Um, and so I think, you know, when we're reaching the end, um, of our lives, that seems like the ultimate degradation that I've, I've gotten back to the place of absolute helplessness. Someone else has to care for me. Right. And we totally miss the beauty in it, which is that someone's caring for you. Yeah. Right. And, and of course it's just, it's just a physical manifestation of our spiritual reality, which is that we need someone to care for us. We can't take care of ourselves. It is. Boy, I tell you the, you know, I, I, and again, I'm going back to Paul, this, this passage in second Corinthians 12 is so incredible. So amazing what Paul is saying there. But here he is ministering. He has um, experiences of God that are like superlative and beyond what anybody else mm -hmm. experienced. And um, what that does to your head, you know, what how that inflates your ego and so forth. And but God humbles him with this thorn in the flesh via Satan, and now he's weak. Um, right. I know it's been a lot of speculation as to what that thorn in the flesh is. Right. Um, I kind of lean towards the view that it had something to do with his eyes, but so, you know, here he is when he comes into the, into someone's presence, he's just obviously weak and how, you know, that doesn't seem like a good platform from which to proclaim truth. Right. <laughs> but well, and he's the truth. <laughs> <laughs> and he says to the Corinthians, you know, when I'm there in person, I don't appear like much and I'm not, I don't seem strong and I appear meek. And um, he says, I don't speak with great eloquence, which, you know, the way he writes, it's kind of hard to believe that anyone can make that claim about him. 
but I thought it would actually be worth reading um, 2 Corinthians 12. Yeah, yeah. Starting at verse 7, maybe. Yeah. He says, to keep me from becoming conceited because of these surpassingly great revelations. So he's talking about these, uh, you know, either in or out of body experiences where he's taken up into the third heaven, whatever that means. And um, he says, there was given me a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast, Paul again, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. And so first it's Christ's or God's power is made perfect in weakness. And then Paul becomes strong through weakness. This is a... I, I cannot imagine living like this. I can't imagine boasting and glorying in hardships, persecutions, difficulties, insults, and weaknesses. You know, I just thought about, I have a friend who's ministering in an African Muslim nation and uh, trying to do farming in that country as a, you know, trying to help the the community through through that mm -hmm. and buying land and so forth and and there was this official who um, called into question the ownership of his property and so forth and um, he was really concerned you know like this guy can can take everything away and I I kind of knew as soon as he told us this he was sharing this with his prayer partners that um, this was, this was God at work. <laughs> you know, this was a chance for God. God was going to do something through this seemingly really terrible weak situation he was in to accomplish his purpose. And that's in fact what he did. Um, God used another official who was over this guy to reprimand that and um, he, he learned and became appreciative of what my friend was doing and decided to help him in that whole process. So it's just, um, you know, the whole idea of, of when we're weak, when things are not going well, that this is an opportunity for God to demonstrate his greatness and power. But then it, it's obvious then it's not me who made this happen. It's him. Right. And that's the story over and over in scripture, right? Like Gideon, you've got too many people. I need to make sure that the world knows that it's the Lord who's going to win the battle. So let's, let's get rid of a few thousand of your soldiers or however many it was. And then let me show you how it's done. There's that dynamic at play, right? Yeah. It's an amazing dynamic. Hmm. You know, uh, what, one of the things that I'm thinking about right now is if this is true, and again, I was just saying, I can't imagine living like this. If this is true, then how do, how do I become that kind of person? And I was just thinking about how not all of them, certainly, but some of the spiritual disciplines are an intentional process of placing myself in a position of weakness and hardship and maybe even suffering. So it's like, if I'm fasting, then I'm saying that, um, you know, I'm going to limit my physical strength so that I can then turn to the strength of God. Or if I'm in solitude and silence, then I'm kind of putting myself in a place of isolation where, which we can all appreciate the difficulty of now. Um, some people are, are doing this home isolation totally alone and they haven't, had physical contact with a person for a month, you know, and, and you're saying, I'm going to place myself in that difficult position to expose myself to my own weakness before the Lord so that I can find strength from him. Hmm. Um, but I'm wondering if you have a comment about that or other ways that we can kind of learn to boast in our weaknesses the way Paul does. Well, you know, I find that, um, <laughs> Every time, let's say, for example, I'm, I'm going to preach, 
Mm-hmm. Um, there's a part of me that is wanting people to see, oh my goodness, what amazing insights Randall has into scripture or, or how well he, right. you know, explained that passage or something like that. You know, I'm wanting yeah. to, uh, something about my strength to be made evident. And I just realized oh, man, that is not, that is not what this is for. This is to minister to God's people. So what if they, what if they see instead that I'm, I do a terrible job <laughs> you know, or whatever. Right. Um, the whole point God is that I need you. I need to depend on you. This has to be you accomplishing something through me. And so just the reminder, I guess, to look at our motivation and understand where we're coming from. And um, I really need to be acknowledging my weakness. Yeah. I think um, what the church used to call mortifying the flesh or mortifying, you know, the, the, the desires, like the one you're talking about for your own vanity, your own ego and putting those to death. So dying to yourself um, I think it's related to taking up our cross. You know, there's these aspects of the Christian life that maybe aren't as popular in our preaching and teaching today, but there's a long tradition of in the, in the church in the 2000 year history of, of being intentional about putting to death those things that are contrary to the ways of God. And a lot of them have to do with our own strength and trusting in the Lord. Yeah, they do. I think even in one sense, uh, you know, worrying is an aspect of uh, trying to uh, bring into command my own strength. Mm -hmm. And Jesus shuts that down. He says, you can't increase your lifespan by worrying. You can't increase your your height by worrying. Um, We really are, even though we're made amazingly powerful, creative beings, Yet still, to some degree, all of that is is not coming from us, but it's from the one who made us. You know, I, th- I think about this, um, Stephen, because on the one hand, you know, we're told we have spiritual gifts, we have capabilities. Um, God says, you know, of the people of Babel, that uh, if they're together and united in this, nothing will be impossible to them. It's right. like he's gifted us with incredible strengths. Yeah. And yet he's telling Paul, you know, in your weakness, my strength is made perfect. So it seems like somehow all all that we are is really um, an expression or a, um, a demonstration of his strength. Yeah. I don't know if you remember that quote, someone asked Karl Barth, what is the most profound aspect of, you know, he's this great theologian, what's the most profound truth you've ever uncovered? And he said, Jesus loves me, this I know. But, it, but there's more to come in that profound little song, you know, uh, little ones to him belong, they are weak, but he is strong. Mm. And, it's, and the little ones are not just the children. I mean, it's a children's song, so we can be just deceived into thinking, yes, children are weak, but God is strong. It's like, no, we're the children. We're the ones who are weak, but he is strong. And there's, um, yeah. One of the things you see over and over in the Psalms, uh, especially David's Psalms is him calling himself needy or poor. Mm -hmm. He's the king. There's nobody in the kingdom (laughs) less needy or poor than him. (laughs) Right. Right. And even Solomon, you know, you have this dynamic going on. So, yeah, but it's an important realization right. to acknowledge that I am poor and needy. Yes. I don't like that. Well, and isn't that why, if, isn't that why so often even, even believers have trouble receiving the gospel because the gospel says, you're not good enough. You can't do it on your own. You'll never make it to God. You'll never make it to heaven by your own works, but Jesus did it all for you. And what happens so often, and you see it in Galatians, I guess, chapter three, 
we start with the gift of salvation and then we try to start earning everything going forward and we either slide into legalism or we slide into you know some kind of workspace salvation where we serve in the church or whatever it is that we're doing uh, but the whole world is addicted to earning you know earning our way some somewhere or another and not obviously there's different iterations of it but the gospel says the exact opposite you'll never earn it but I've earned it for you and just receive it as a gift. Yeah. You know, I have a, a blog, ask the pastors and I get a lot of emails and some guy saw something I had responded to a guy about um, how sinful we are and messed up we are. <laughs> and, uh, and he was really taking exception to that. And I realized, you know, all he was seeing was one aspect of the truth of what scripture tells us we are depraved, but the other aspect is we are glorious. Mm -hmm. I guess I'm, I'm sort of trying to wrestle with that. How did those two fit together? <laughs> and in this whole weakness and strength thing, because, um, I am an amazing godlike creature. Yeah. Well, C.S. Lewis I, talks I, about that, right? Yeah. Okay. If we could see each other as we truly were. And I think yeah. what he says is something like this we would either be appalled at the monstrosity that's before us, like this wicked monster, or we'd be tempted to bow down and worship one another. You know, we, we don't see the, the, neither the depths nor the heights of what God is, God is, or what's in us. Yeah. And I guess the way I, I sort of harmonize that is that, yes, there is all this glorious godlike stuff coming from me. Mm -hmm. And it's from me, but it's really the Lord. Right. Expressing You're reflecting through me. Yeah. Reflecting the glory of the Lord as the image of God. The, the Greek word in Genesis is the icon that you're, you're an image that points back to something else. Yeah. It made me think of Hebrews one, you know, the author yep. describes Jesus as the radiance of God's glory. Mm -hmm. So he's, he's the radiance, but it's, it's what God is irradiating himself. It's just, it's a profound and ultimately incomprehensible, I'm sure. Right. Idea, but somehow both are true. I read in a commentary on Mark um, about, it was about Jesus um, when he takes the coin, he says, whose image is on this coin? And the, uh, the commentator, um, Abraham Kuravilla, I think is his name. He's, he was talking about how, um, you know, when a coin is pressed, the image of the, of the, of the Lord, Caesar is Lord, was the, was the claim of, of the Romans. Mm -hmm. That, C, you know, Caesar is Lord, Caesar is king, Caesar is God, essentially. And then his image is printed on that coin. And the same way God imprints his image on us. And, you know, over course of sin and and time and life and everything that image gets worn off worn off but what jesus comes he reprints the image of god on us so that we can once again display the radiance and the glory of and the image of the one who created us but how important is to remember i'm still just a coin like humility is a completely discounted virtue in our age in our day um, I think we talk about what's your platform or how are you presenting yourself on social media? Even what we're doing right now is, has some, some danger there, but um, humility is probably one of the most important virtues that the Bible describes for human beings. Well, you know, I'm not really drawn to people who brag about themselves, right? I'm drawn to people who are humble, <laughs> who are, who, acknowledge their failures and faults yeah i'm really impressed how drawn you are to me yeah because i'm one of those people <laughs> <laughs> but, i i remember the uh, I, I was so impressed with the uh, good to great book uh jim collins yeah um in his study of all these businesses that weren't just good but had demonstrated greatness for, you know for years and he said the one thing I did not want to find out about my study was that it had something to do with the leaders of these companies. And he said, but what, what actually was the case was it was, it had something to do with the leaders of these companies. But he said what he found out about these leaders was that they were the kind of leaders 
who were absolutely almost uh, fanatically driven to make their companies great, but they were at the same time exceedingly humble. Mm. So when something succeeded, they pointed to their team and how they made it success it's because of them. If something went wrong, they took the yeah. blame. Right. Um, yeah. That's, and that's, well, that's what Jesus says about leadership. He says, you know, if you're going to be a leader, you're not going to be like the Gentiles who lord it over one another, but you're going to be the servant of everyone. Because really what we're talking about in this call to weakness is to live like Jesus so Jesus was the ultimate person who found strength and weakness and what theologians call the cruciform life, which is to, to take on that cross, to, to be willing to go essentially to death. Um, you know, it says in Philippians 2, Jesus, who, who was God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped onto or held onto. He lets go of it and he humbles himself to be found in the likeness of a human being. And then not only does he become human from God to human, which is a huge jump, he then becomes the servant of all. And then he becomes the slave of all by going to the cross. But then his name is lifted up and is raised up above all other names by the Lord. So the Lord gives Jesus glory when Jesus releases all of it through his humility. Yeah, as Jesus taught on many occasions, whoever humbles himself will be exalted. Mm -hmm. Whoever exalts himself <laughs> will be humbled. Right. Paul had to be humbled. He didn't humble himself. Right. He had to be humbled. Mm -hmm. But God still, but God used that to demonstrate his own greatness through Paul. Strength made perfect in our weakness. What a and then I'm still struck by Paul saying, then I am strong. But it's God's strength in him that makes him strong, not his own. Yeah. What's even more amazing is that he delights in it. <laughs> and he tells about it, which yes. we're back. We're back to first, uh, first John one, confess your sins to one another, you know, walk in the truth, uh, walk in the light, be exposed. And, and there's a dynamic of the gospel that makes that possible for us in a way that it's not possible for anyone else because in the church, in theory, but I mean, this is, I mean, it's true whether people realize it or not, but in the church, you're surrounded by people who all acknowledge that they're not good enough, who all acknowledge that they're weak and they needed a strong God to save them. So for you to present your weakness in the church, uh, you're not open to the same, again, theoretically, you're not open to the same uh, uh, predation that you are outside the church where people are at least pretending to be good enough or refusing to acknowledge that they're, that they're weak. So you're not going to be taken advantage of, you're going to be welcomed and loved and supported and received and cared for. And I think that's part of the strength that's made perfect in weakness is that God is using, God is using us to minister to one another, not only out of our weaknesses, but in each other's weaknesses. Yeah. And then he uses those weaknesses that we have as the launching pad for our ministry to other people in weakness. Mm -hmm. So with the comfort you have been given, you will comfort others. I was thinking that same thing. Back to Second Corinthians, huh? Right, chapter one. Yep. What a letter. Yeah. <laughs> oh my goodness. So I like Paul's statement in there too in chapter two. Who is sufficient for these things, the ministry that he's been given? Who is sufficient? Nobody is sufficient. Right. Right, except until we get to the book of Revelation, who, who can open these scrolls? There's no one. Right. Ah, but there's one. There's one who is worthy to open the scrolls. There's one who is worthy of the ministry of reconciliation and redemption, and it's Jesus Christ. Yeah. Man, I almost want to cry every time I even think about that passage. I forget the chapter right now. Do you remember it? Yeah, it's uh, Revelation 5. 5, Okay. It just, it hits me in like a deep spot every time because, you know, John is up in glory, right? And he's looking around. Will there be anyone who can fulfill God's will here? And he, doesn't he weep when he realizes there's no one? He does. Man, and then, bam, Jesus shows up. Yeah, the lamb who was slain. Right. 
So, and it's the weakness of Jesus that is on display in Revelation chapter 5 that makes him worthy. He was slain. He's the meek lamb who was killed. Yeah, he's called both the Lion of Judah and right. the Lamb who was slain. Yeah. A powerful image. And the weak, weak one. Image. Yep. Simultaneously, yeah. There's there's a lot to this that I think most of the time we don't even think about. This dynamic between power and weakness. In the economy of God, they are intrinsically connected. And what we're seeing, even in the church, is that we're seeing Christians and people consistently striving for power through strength. We've got to get the vote out and get our politicians in place. We've got to raise the money to have resources to do this, that, and the other. We want to look good and have, you know, the nice clothes so that we can look good to the world and look powerful to the world. And I, and I think that Jesus is just saying, no, that is not my way. Hannah's testimony, Samuel's mother, was that it is not by strength that one prevails. And I want my prayer to be based on what Paul said, Lord, teach me to delight mm -hmm. in my weaknesses. Yeah, so I think we'll wrap up there. It's a good admonition that we would have the same attitude that, that Paul had, which is to delight in his weaknesses and to walk the way that Jesus walked at cruciform life where he's always putting himself low and letting, letting God really raise him up, letting God empower him, not seeking to have the power on his own. And he's the perfect model for us. You know, and I think if we, if we can live like that, then we'll, we'll see, we'll see really the power of God revealed in our lives. So thank you guys for sticking in with us. This has been uh, fun for us to do, and hopefully we'll have more of these in the future. If you have a comment or question, please put it in the, the, uh, below the video. And also, if you have any topics that you'd like for us to consider doing a video on, let us know in the comment section and we'll take that into account. All right. Thanks a lot.